um, for our, uh, our launch for the newest publication by the Vermont Historical Society, We People in Vermont, the Paradox of Development of the 20th Century. Um, if you have not already gotten your copy, please make sure you can grab a copy uh, and have Paul sign it for you today. We are we're really delighted to, to publish this book, which is a follow-up to Paul's previous research. Um, his previous book was called Two Vermonts, uh, Absolutely sure. Geography and Identity, 1865 to 1910. I always miss the years of the um, Which is, in my humble opinion, definitely one of the better Vermont history books in recent years um, to analyze some often overlooked uh, sort of schisms and tensions within the history of Vermont that really still exist in Vermont today. But the past never really leaves us in that sense. Um, Paul, if you're not familiar with him already, is a professor at Northern Vermont University. Um, where he teaches history. Uh, he received his doctorate from New York University. And uh, if you Google his name, he's, he's quite a prolific uh, speaker on uh, the Center for Research on Vermont's YouTube channel, as well as a, a number of other um, places. So if you're fascinated by his work today, you can go home with this book. You can find quite a bit more of his scholarship. Uh, I also want to mention before I, I, I let Paul speak about his work, um, they were very pleased to be spending the summer promoting this book and talking about its themes. Uh, sponsored, they, they part of a grant that was sponsored by the Vermont Humanities Council. Um, we're going to be go traveling all over the state, uh, St. Albans to Bennington to Brattleboro to St. Johnsbury, and uh, having the book available, having Paul speak as he will today a little bit about the book, and then really using the lessons learned from the book, the lessons learned from history, to uh, start community conversations. Um, take those lessons from the past and talk about what should our community look like in the future? How, how can we have these conversations with each other that may be difficult, but are sort of crucial um, to thinking about how your community should move forward into the 21st century. So we're really excited um, to spend the summer using the lessons of the past to, to spark conversations about the future. So if you want to learn more about that programming, um, if we're also offering, so we're sponsoring these programs, so we've written a program guide and are making it available for anyone, any other library or historical society that wants to have that program and do it themselves, so the program guide to download. So check out vermonthistory.org uh, if you want to learn more about um, that programming series and the work that we're going to be doing this summer. I'm really excited to, to get in there and have some really substantive conversations uh, using the lessons from this book. So that was a very long preamble, but it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul, who will speak to you today uh, about the work behind his book. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank you all so much for coming on this beautiful day. Um, I'm really flattered. And um, I um, actually, as Amanda knows, I'm going to try out some of the material I'm going to take on the road. Uh, you know, just sort of like a rough draft of the talk that I'm going to be giving around the state. Um, it's going to be a little truncated because I have a lot of thank yous. Uh, but maybe about, I don't, we'll, we'll see the timing. I thought it would be about 20 minutes and then 10 minutes of thank yous or something like that. Um, and uh, when I do go out on the road to hold these sessions that Amanda's talking about. I think that like my main goal is to try to get people to understand why in the late 1940s and the 1950s that the chair of the Development Commission, uh, which was responsible for stimulating the state's economy, was a back to the lander guy who hated change and didn't want any development. And that's kind of hard, I think, to kind of wrap your brain around. Like, why would you have that guy be your, the guy who's supposed to stimulate the, um, the economy? Um, but I need, before I get to that, um, give people the big picture. And the big picture is that I, when I was a graduate student, I saw the people who were the Vermont historians, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be one of those, you know? And so now I consider myself very, very lucky to be able to teach Vermont history as, you know, at, on the university level every spring. And I think it's reasonable for people to uh, in the Vermont history community to come to me, and I don't think they don't actually do this, but it's reasonable that they should, to say, okay, well, you know, you have this incredible luxury. You get to teach Vermont history every year. What have you learned? Uh, what do you have to say? Do you have anything original to say? And the answer is not really in the big picture. I don't actually have that much original to say. Uh, the, the, the big picture of the book is, as Alan named it, the paradox of development in Vermont, is something that, I mean, I've known since I really thrust myself into Vermont history. And if I could say it as succinctly as possible, um, the paradox is that making Vermont look natural takes a lot of work. Making Vermont look, and this is what people in the 20th century discovered. If you want Vermont to stay the same, you need to change it a lot. You need to make, if you want it to look natural, 
it, that is going to take a lot of work, and it's going to cost you some of the state's um, traditions. Um, you know, that's the process that Dramanos found out in the 20th century, and that goes not only for the physical landscape, that if you want Vermont's physical landscape to stay the same, then you need to change it. But it also goes to the human landscape, which is just as important. Um, and then so out of that paradox of keeping Vermont natural takes a lot of work, come other paradoxes. Require, preserving Vermont requires innovation. Uh, you need to be a dynamic and creative society so that you can stay the same. Uh, and certainly preserving some Vermont traditions necessarily means you have to sacrifice others. And that's, I mean, that's the general um, paradox. Um, and what Sam Ogden was trying to save was this thing that had developed by the pro early post-war period, which was this concept of the Vermont way of life. And um, the Vermont way of life, as he understood and other people understood it, was not just about a beautiful scenic landscape, but it was about the human landscape too. It was about, and the political landscape. It was about small, beautiful towns with really strong communities and local politics that really mattered so that that would encourage civic engagement. All those things combined in order to create the Vermont way of life, which people like Sam found so attractive, and he wanted to save it. Uh, and then, of course, then in the process of saving it, he changed the state. I, you, you only need to look any farther than um, his 30-year war against billboards. Uh, is that it, what he thought what he was doing, and it's reasonable, you know, was, was saving Vermont, preserving Vermont. But it wasn't a matter of him keeping Vermont looking the way that it already looked. It, what he wanted to do was make the state look at, it, like what he thought it should look like and operate the way he thought it should look like. So in the process of preserving, he changed things. And um, this is not by any means a um, revelation that this is the paradox, making Vermont look natural, takes a lot of work. Uh, when I first like, plunged myself into reading as much Vermont history as I could, I came across this all the time. Uh, I would recommend to you Frank Bryan, who taught political science at UVM. In 1974, he wrote, what the world needs is a community axiom which promises a return to the good old days, traditional American values, to a simple life of interpersonal relations where individuals still control events in society generally, and government as well. But if he wrote, if people move, 1974, if people move to Vermont, they'll be disappointed because the community axiom is being taken over by the system axiom. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, there's a reason why the system axiom is coming into place. He said what will happen is, Vermonters will be heavily taxed, isolated by choice, and spiteful to outsiders. And it's like, yeah, but the system axiom, what we just learned was that we need the system axiom in order to, because big problems require big solutions. And, um, you know, we don't want to destroy Vermont's glorious traditions of local control and strong communities, but large problems require large solutions. In 1990, Joel Sherman wrote Fast Lane on a Dirt Road, and he wrote, from having been a remote world of small mill towns and hill farms in only 30 years before, by the 1980s, Vermont now found itself within a day's drive of 65 million people. Tax subsidies were needed to prop up agriculture as a livelihood and as a visual backdrop. For tourism, the state was laced with a plethora of environmental and social programs that required steadily increasing revenues along with a large bureaucracy to implement it. And looming over the state and the times was yet another painful paradox. Growth threatens Vermont's special sense of place, but maintaining that sense of place with its pastoral look, open places, and small towns threatens to make Vermont elitist, an upscale gateway for the rich. And it's like, yeah, well, people don't want Vermont to become a mecca playground for the rich people. That's not what the goal is. but. There's, it's really complicated, all these trade-offs that need to be made. How do you negotiate these paradoxes and dilemmas is hard. And I think that the nature of this paradox really, for me, hit home um, in like 1999, 2000, when I saw this movie. And I was at UVM, and I was watching every Vermont movie I could possibly watch they had in their collection. And I ran across one called The Inheritors. And it states these things the paradox very well. I thought I'd show you two little bits of it. And uh, here we are. This first talks about tourism. In 1990, the Vermont legislature established a very big one in the living room to grow legal to the country. The state of the capital of the only legal to the famous farm in the summer home. The diary of the big farm is one of the community. 
Sometimes these pressures are open, often they come 
within people. And it took Vermont a while to get there. And so the book starts with the state leaders having contempt for the rural landscape and for the people who live there. It's so much so that they wanted to engineer the human landscape. And if you could engineer the human landscape and replace the losers with better people, then you could have a more prosperous economy. And, and the landscape would look different. Um, but of course, Valentine did a lot to kick off tourism. The Board of Agriculture decided, well, we can't sell them as farms, we can sell them as summer homes. And by the time you get to the Bureau of Publicity, when I was doing the research, I was amazed by this thing, which is that the Bureau of Publicity, the people, Walter Crockett, those people, they thought that the loss of the conversion of farms to summer homes was great. It was wonderful. And it goes all the way up through the Vermont Country Life Commission in 1929 and 30. Walter Crockett's like, well, you know, 10 year, 20 years ago, we only had eight farms available in these three towns to have, um, for people to buy summer homes. But now it's great because we have 60. And it's like, well, yeah, but the loss of every single farm, that's a tragedy for some family. That's a tragedy for a farmer who thought he'd be farming forever and couldn't. That's a tragedy for their kids who won't, thought someday they'd inherit the farm. And now it's bought by someone from somewhere else. And there was so little recognition that this is a tragedy. At least it's a tragedy for some people, not others. So this indifference to the human landscape was amazing. And that's where Sam Ogden comes in. And Sam Ogden, when he arrived, he, um, and there are some people who really get um, the, the change that tourism brought both to the physical landscape and also to the human landscape, the cost of that as far as strong communities go. Because community is shared experiences. It's not physical. It's about long-term shared experiences and relationships. And it diminishes community when you replace the people with newcomers. And so what happened was um, that uh, Sam wrote when he arrived that he loved the people who lived there. He thought it was, uh, you know, these wonderful, amazing people. He said all of them were peculiar, uh, some more peculiar than others. Uh, but he thought that the people who lived in Landgrove were just amazing, wonderful people. Right, all really interesting people. And then he launched himself into his project and he rehabilitated the village and he attracted all these people who were artists and architects and puppeteers to have be a part of this Land Grove experience. And 
the people who he attracted replaced the people who lived there who he fell in love with when he arrived. He wanted the people who lived there to stay. He wanted new interesting people to come and join him in this experiment. And he wanted the town to stay the same size. It, something had to give. It, it, you, you know, either, either you're going to grow or you're going to replace the people who lived there. And he, but he wanted to save that Vermont way of life as he understood it. And um, there's this book called, by Earl of Newton called The Vermont Story. And he writes about Sam Ogden when he became commissioner, uh, the chair of the Development Commission. Sam Ogden first served as member of the Vermont Development Commission and in 1947 became its chairman. He has no vast plans to lure great industries into the state, nor to promote a great wave of indiscriminate tourist travel. He represents the wise synthesis of the native and the newcomer in his desire to see the state develop along progressive lines without a sacrifice of his individuality and its more or less unique way of life. So he's going to develop it along progressive lines, but keep it the same. And I mean, that's the problem. I mean, he, uh, what kind of a development commissioner doesn't want any industries? Uh, and so that's kind of the thing that I have to give convey to people when I go out on, on the road. Um, and what makes the Vermont way of life possible? Uh, Earl Newton in that book is really clear about it. Life in rural communities in Vermont <coughs> offers the newcomer and his family opportunities for participation in the affairs of the community to an extent not possible elsewhere. In the city's interest in the community affairs has practically disappeared. The growth of large centers of population absorbs surrounding towns and villages and the gathering together of rootless thousands, the impersonal and natural apartment houses have all contrived to bring about the complete disappearance of community spirit in those places. Well, probably an exaggeration, but, but this is not true in the country. In the country, the individual is called upon to participate in the affairs of the community in which he lives. The key being, it has to exist on a small scale. It's something that Lewis Mumford, a historian of the city, said around the same time, that it has to stay on a small scale. And so he was the development commissioner who didn't want development. Um, and so as part of being the development commissioner, he um, authorized money to be spent on some movies. And one of them is called Background of the Living, which is a wonderful movie. I'll show you two parts of that. And the pleasure to the boys. No means always measured in money. The waters are open to holiday makers with yachts. They're open to those who like to dive and swim and bask on the hundreds of beaches. Recreation may be as active or as restful as the age and disposition of vacationers may prefer, although there is ample evidence that in Vermont, years seem to do little to abate a youthful zest in living. Some visitors enjoy the facilities of family resort centers while others choose the more rural Vermont of apple blossoms signaling spring in hillside orchards. Some prefer summer horseback trips over miles of little traveled roads and woodland trails, trails which turn to red and gold when autumn shimmers northward through the mountains. And of course, there are the famous mountain slopes where snow lies crisp and deep throughout the winter. What can Vermont mean to you? Well. If you're an artist like William Chaldack, it will mean an infinite variety of subjects for your brush and canvas. To Sam Ogden, it has meant the creative satisfaction of restoring a once abandoned community to vigorous life, largely by the work of his own hands. Okay. A couple things going on here. First of all, if I was a development commissioner and I authorized the movies, I would totally put myself into it. You, know, you can't blame like Sam for being my book. I'll give you the money, but only if I can get it. Uh, number two, nothing says development like senior citizens playing croquet. And number three, if it, it, it requires yachts, it's probably measured in money. Um, and the whole thing, this whole movie is, is fabulous. Uh, there is a story that leads through it, though, uh, where uh, this fellow here, uh, and uh, this is the part here, is a real estate agent. And uh, there's this family that wants to buy, and so, this house. And they're very white and very middle class. And by the way, the specific house hasn't changed, but this is basically Valentine's list of 1890. And this is this list of farms. Um, so anyway, there's this family, and they have this crusty real estate agent. And he totally is checking them out to make sure they're going to fit in the community. And, uh, yeah, and 
so you know, all sorts of skiing scenes. You get Norman Rockwell talking about how wonderful the place is, uh, and uh, this kind of thing. As for me, a place to live, a place to work, and a place to live. Right. It's all about the wrong way of life. It's not just about a beautiful landscape. The church on the ground. And above all, it will mean a community which is home. So, I mean, that's, that, that's the transition in the 20th century, which is, in the 1920s, the Bureau of Publicity sold Vermont as a beautiful landscape. America, Switzerland, vacation land, unslowed Vermont, and it was about the landscape. But it wasn't about the human landscape. It wasn't about the wrong way of life and how integral and important community is to that. And Vermont has this, whereas other places have lost it. Which brings us to the final scene here with the real estate agent. You know, sometimes folks call me crotchety and stubborn. Yes, they do. But the way I feel about it, this isn't a big town, and we don't have room for those that don't fit in. But you folks do. And I want you to know you're going to have that house if I have to sell it to you. Which is weird. Like, was that a thing where, like, the real estate agents got to decide who gets to live in town? Was that really a thing? I mean, and clearly the message is, okay, so here's this heterosexual, white, middle class family. If you are deviating from that, your people don't fit. Uh, you know, don't come because you're just going to find a real estate agent who will humiliate you by refusing to sell your house. So don't bother coming. And so that's weird. Um, was that really a thing where real estate agents get to choose who gets to live in the town? It sounds like Alabama is very Jim Crow, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but there's something else here that I think is really important, which is this. Cross the Yes, they do. The way I feel about it, this is the big town. We don't have one for. Whoops, uh, well, we got the idea there, but we don't have one for people who live here. Yes, they do. The way I feel about it, this is the big town. And we. The boy, the girl, are they, how long are they going to live in that town? When they're 18, they're going to bail, right? They're, they're not going to stay, are they? And, and I have no problem at all with middle class white families with children buying houses in small towns in Vermont. I'm one of them. But you can't have just that. If, if it's a total turnover. She's out of there at 18. She's going to go to UVM or she's going to go to BC or whatever. And she, she's out of that town. If you have this constant turnover of people, the very community the Development Commission was selling is going to get lost. And so that's really the central paradox, you know? Oh, by the, the last part, actually. Um, I'm a little weird. Right? This part here. Whoops. So they come up to the house here, and um, they go in a new house. Takes down the sign, and the guy says, "Look at the view." And the home the home buyer is like, "Yeah, yeah, they're not going to talk there, are they?" And I say, "No, no, that's National Forest Land. Don't worry about it." Right here, yeah. And they're not going to have to change that part of it. Uh, not part of that, of course. So that's the thing. And so, you know, Sam, a lot of people who've caught in this thing about trying to save Vermont, but necessarily changing it. And through the 60s is really, I think, a crucial decade when Vermont was like, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to be this, we're going to be that. And um, Sam Ogden served as the head of the Sinui Committee, Commission in order to advise the Hoff administration on what they should do about Vermont's landscape. And he said what we need is a giant statewide land use commission with lots of zoning and lots of rules and lots of regulations. And you could not possibly pass that as long as you had the one town, one vote legislature. And then, so what happened was they reapportioned in 1965 and we got Act 250. And Sam Ogden got the law he wanted and he thought reapportionment was the worst thing that ever happened to Vermont. And it's like, you can't have it both ways. There's always, you know, I mean, it's a bit of a zero-sum game. But what the, um, the commission, what, what the uh, studies that the Hoff administration did 
um, were summarized in their 1968 vision and choice um, about Vermont's future. It was a state framework for how to move forward. It's, it was called Rejecting the Inevitable. This statement is offered as a contribution to public discussion, critically needed of the fundamental choices facing the people of Vermont. Such an effort is required if Vermont, its state and local government and its people are going to control the destiny of the state. And after identifying some challenges, it ends, Vermont has an opportunity and an obligation to the nation to pioneer in the search for new ways to achieve a harmonious and creative society. It needs to change, because that's the only way it can stay the same. And so, um, to this day, you know, the tension between preserving the physical landscape while changing and preserving the human landscape, which is just as important, while still improving it with new people, causes Vermont to be a really conflicted society. Um, at once we embrace progress, and on the other we worry about forces that often come from faraway places with strange sounding names, like Pennsylvania. Uh, and it is in the 18, 1910s, it's not a century ago, we're not so completely indifferent to the importance of the persistence of the human landscape, um, alongside the preservation of the physical landscape. But the question we want to ask, I think when I go down the road is, well how are we doing at it? Do people feel like we're negotiating this complex path well, uh, you know, the physical and the human landscape. So that's, is that pretty much, Alan, is that pretty much where I want to go with that when I go on the road? It's pretty much what the book's about, right? Would you say? Okay, well, um, if you have anything to say to me about um, the, uh, th that, what I've just said, I would be grateful, but I do want, I probably run over, I don't have a clock on me. Um, to say that this has been a long project. I think it's been eight years, and just so you have a sense of how long eight years is, um, Peter, stand up. He was in kindergarten when I started this project. <laughs> he was in kindergarten, uh, and I always taught the story of the Swedes, because I run across it in my first book to my students in Vermont history, and always the punchline was, they all moved to Minnesota. And then I thought, I really don't know the story, so I started to look into it. And then, of course, I, I discovered that the Swedes had settled, at least some of them had settled in Landgrove. And so then after I was going, I wrote an article about it. I began to interact with the people in Landgrove, Priscilla Grayson in particular. And the people in Landgrove are wonderful people and helped me so much with this project. After the article was done, I decided what I wanted to do was I could write a history of 20th century Vermont through the lives of the Swedes and their descendants. And then I drove around the state and interviewed people um, who were descendants of the Swedes. And it's an amazing thing about life where you, it's nice to be reminded about how good, how nice people can be, you know, and how open and giving and generous they can be. Um, three of the people I interviewed aren't alive anymore, you know, I mean, so I'm very grateful that I did the research when I could. Um, I want to thank Michael Sherman for editing that article. Um, much of what you read at the beginning of the book is Michael Sherman's um, handiwork. Uh, so then after I worked on it for like five years, I had this moment where I was like, okay, I have enough of a manuscript. And then I had to call Alan and be like, Alan, I've been working on a book for five years. You're going to publish it, right? <laughs> you know, because I never wanted anyone to um, publish it except for the VHS press. I think the VHS always does an amazing job with its books. And I'm so lucky be with my first book, UPNE is a different organization. I have no problem with them. But I mean, they approved the book, then they sent me the manuscript back, I fixed it up, sent it to them. They decided on the title and the cover and everything, and they just printed. And near the end of this process, Alan was asking me, what color do you want your name to be on the cover? And you know, at that point, I was like, oh, Alan, I don't need to just publish it, please. <laughs> you know? I mean, the amount of close attention and care and detail and love that Alan gave this book is staggering. It is really amazing. And um, now and then, I mean, one of the things I didn't really predict would be how much the VHS would get behind the book, um, unlike if I'd done it with another press. And it's been amazing. Um, yeah, I'm just so flattered, and I'm going to take this book out on the road. And obviously, I'm really grateful to Amanda, and I'm looking forward to working with her all summer um, and, and beyond, hopefully. Um, James Brisson did a great job with the book. I think it looks really beautiful. Um, the VHS Publications Committee. I'm very grateful to them for approving the book. Um, Eileen Corcoran and Lisa Angel, if I said that right, um, have been a big aid to the book as well. And I also am grateful to Joy Worland from the Vermont Department of Libraries for helping with the uh, book tour that's coming up, and also the Vermont Humanities Council, uh, who have gotten behind the book too. So now I've introduced the book to you, and now let's take it out on the road. What do you think? What do you think, Amanda? Let's take it as a, take this, this circus on the road. 
Um, so I don't actually have any concept of whether I've talked for 15 minutes or 45, but um, will, do you think I'll be able to get people to be engaged with this concept of the balance of trying to preserve the physical landscape and the human landscape? And, trying to maintain the, the special sense of community that Vermont is the Vermont way of life. Um, yes, please, yeah. My opinion is Vermont's gonna look 100 years from now like it looks now, the rural landscape, and it's due to the Vermont Land Trust. If you take a look at how many easements have been granted so far, you know, there isn't going to be much land left out there that's not covered by these easements. Mm -hmm. The second thing is Act 250. You Which know, is the punchline of my book, Act 250. So if you have an economic benefit for development, you've got to go through Act 250. And some people would say it's not supportive of new stuff. So mm -hmm. what we have here, we have uh, education and health care and local government. That's where the jobs are, and we're losing people. Mm -hmm. So, again, supporting my opinion, uh, uh, good luck. <clears throat> Economic forces are going to, uh, you know, they're just not going to be able to overcome what's in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, to say that it's going to look 100 years from now like it looks now, the, the, the backdrop to this whole the book is that there was an old economy and it revolved around dairy farming, extractive industries like lumber and quarrying, and small time manufacturing. And where there's this Vermont way of life in this world that Sam Ogden and other people wanted to save, that old economy died. And then the question was, what do we replace it with? And to a great extent, the answer was tourism, was recreation. And so that's where we are now. And you, you think we'll be there in 100 years still? Kind of like this, yes. You know, the, the ski industry just reported for the last 37 years, the number of skiers has been constant for the last 37 years. Mm -hmm. And golfing is a distressed industry. So if you kind of walk up here and golf and ski, you know, we're looking at industries that are not going to grow that much. Mm -hmm. So what are we gonna do? Yeah. A lot of our kids need assistance, food assistance, and in our school systems here, we feed a lot of kids at lunch. And a lot of, a lot of people in this state don't have enough food to eat, and we're coming to the rescue, I think, Food bank. Mm -hmm. So how long will we be able to hang on like this? Yeah, it was, this is one of the questions I want to, in, in the mid-1930s, right, the planning board did this thing called the graphic survey. And it was the first really comprehensive kind of look at the economy like that and what they should do. And they said, well, dairy farming's going out, quarrying and timber are going out, uh, you know, all these. The only industry that shows a great possibilities for growth is recreation. And the state, to a great extent, put its eggs in that basket. And I want to ask you, well, was that a good idea? Was that really a good idea? Yeah, please. It, it, I moved here in, in 1969, and um, um, two things, married into an old Vermont family, two things I heard then that impacted hugely the economic development of the state were Phil Hoff's declaration um, of necessity of refrigeration, of instant refrigeration of milk, which shut down a lot of the small farmers. Mm -hmm. And then the arrival of IBM in Chittenden County. And IBM has changed Chittenden County to a degree that um, is not applicable in any other part of the state. And its decline is going to have more impact over the state, it mm -hmm. strikes me, over the next 50, 30 years than anything else. Um, you want to comment on that? I lived in Essex for 10 years. I lived in Essex. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the economy's going to evolve, and people need to figure out, OK, what's next? And I don't know to what extent we're sort of in that stage. Um, but I think there is a consensus in Vermont. It needs to be consistent with the preservation of the, land, of the physical landscape, you know? Um, but, you know. So much has been lost in Chittenden Yeah. Well, they do have a Costco, which is really nice. <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, and there were really nice things about living there. But, uh, you know, Essex is the second largest town in Vermont now. 
And when IBM arrived, it was a farming community. And, and obviously, if Sam Ogden was here, he'd say, you know why reapportionment was the worst thing that happened in the state? Because Chittenden County gets everything it wants. So Chittenden County calls all the shots in the state now. And they get all the resources, and they get all the attention from the state, you know, which I think there's something to that. Uh, someone over here wanted to, uh, the, oh yeah, please. I'll go right to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a, one really important thing in this whole discussion is climate change. And in a couple of different ways, I think one is the ultimate changes, which will, probably will occur with things like the skiing industry, even boating and pollution on the lake, and so on. Speaking of the recreational uh, industry and tourism. And another is that I. I can see a day, maybe not as far out as we would hope, when Vermont has become kind of an area of refuge for other parts of the country. I mean, people have been coming up here for 50 or 60 years to get away from the city anyway. And pretty soon, when the waters are lapping the shores of Manhattan and Boston, there'll be more of that. You know, we've also morphed our agriculture away from dairy into uh, more value-added products and uh, uh, vegetables and so on. We may be growing food for New England simply because we're not under water. Uh, and meanwhile, then other industries like the maple industry will be moving north of the border because of climate change. So I think those forces are multifaceted and really important. Yeah, and, and we'll still be even more. We'll be dealing with this problem, which is okay. You go out to the people of mind and say, "Well, do you want to have a more dynamic economy? Do you want to have more jobs? Do you want to have more uh, industry? Do you want to have? Do you want to be able to keep young people? Do you want to raise the tax base?" You say, "Yes, yeah, sure." Do you want the state to change? Do you want your town to get bigger? Oh no, I don't want my town to get bigger. I like it the way it is, right? And so, probably climate change is going to heighten that paradox. Do you, you think so? Yeah. yeah. Bruce, yeah, please. Uh, well, speaking of paradox, yeah. uh, Governor Davis, who I think was the environmental governor, uh, made several speeches. Uh, one at the beginning of the 1970 session of the legislature, and he's, he said this, if we do these things, he was promoting the passage of Act 250 because the Gibb Commission had just been uh, delivered its report to the legislature, we could have development without destruction. And I find that paradoxical yeah. because development generally in one way or another does involve destruction of local ecosystems. So that, that was interesting. Um, listening to the realtor, uh, you know, I'm chair of the uh, yeah. State Library Board and so I've spent a lot of time researching Dorothy Canfield Fisher yeah. over the last two years. And she was perhaps the premier spokesperson for Vermont in the 20s and the 30s. But she also spoke in language similar to his. You can find it. She mm -hmm. spoke about the kinds of people she wanted. She didn't want people who were too rich, but college professors, professionals, not people who are accustomed to handling money, which is a loaded phrase. But mm -hmm. um, she promoted what the Rutland Herald called selective immigration. So it, mm -hmm. it's, there's an echo of, of that thing. And then Arthur Wallace Peach chaired the Committee on Traditions and Ideals, Norwich professor, later uh, executive director of the Vermont Historical Society. They were also promoting that idea of the kind of people we want here in Vermont. At the mm -hmm. same time, the Committee on Summer Tourists, or, or uh, you know, summer economy, they were promoting development, uh, more attracting more people, very interesting arguments. Even within, I think, the uh, Commission on Economy, BCCL, uh, there were arguments, I think, within that body itself, because although there were only about 250 people or so, uh, they had diverse points of view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Dorothy Cantor Fisher in the late 30s for the Bureau of Publicity um, wrote a pamphlet about Vermont Summer Homes for Sale. And it was mostly houses that Sam fixed up. Either Sam's house is in there, and Rockwell Kent's house is in there. And they're all it's like, oh, they're, they're all these people are 
artists and college professors, they're intellectuals, they think with their brains, you know, and, and it's like the sort of thing, well, that land growth, that's the model, right? Is the land growth the perfect model? Look at all the talented artistic people who live there. Uh, and it's staying the same size, too, and it's not becoming like Cape Cod or Florida where it's over, overdone, you know? Um, and, but the only way you can keep it the same size and if you attract those people is to chase away the other people. And there wasn't a whole lot of recognition like on Dorothy Canfield Fisher's part that that's a problem. She didn't really, she was fine with it. You know, take the uneducated people, kick them out, bring in the educated people, be a much better state. Was Mason Harbor in any of these uh, movies, do you know? The Basin Harbor Club? The Beach. Uh, uh, you know, the Beach family. Well, sword. yeah, I do, I do know it, yeah. Uh, not in this always, one. But. All white faces here. Oh, yeah. And, and, and uh, the tourist industry was particularly against uh, Jews mm -hmm. and, and blacks. And this Senator Stafford told me the story. It's rather sort of sad and numerous at the same time, but I've not been able to find the transcript. Uh, Mr. Beach was sued. Uh, by a New York resident who was Jewish because he was denied entry into Basin Harbor. You yeah. got Stella Hackle's uh, husband, who was a lawyer. Stella was a Vermont State Treasurer for a while. And they got him on the stand, and, and uh, Beach's lawyer said, Mr. Beach, are you, you anti-Semitic? And he said, no, I just can't stand Jews. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it just it's interesting. I mean, I mean, what kind of a development commission's policy is, all right, if you're not white, middle class, married, heterosexual, we don't want you here. We're going to ex exclude, what, 90% of the population, whatever. If you're gay, don't move here. We don't want you here. You won't fit in. And what, what way to stimulate the state economy to go about it like that? But that was what, where we found ourselves by 1948, you know? Hopefully we, are, <laughs> it's better, but that's, if you don't fit in, don't come here. But the yeah. were full of that eugenics movement, it wasn't just localized to here. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was pervasive around oh, yeah. the country. Yeah, yeah. And it's still in places. Yeah, but it, it has that sort of, I mean, the, sort of the, the whole concept of like saving the Vermont way of life and saving strong communities and that communitarian, because Vermont is what America used to be. Vermont's on a small scale. Vermont has local government and, and civic engagement and all these wonderful things that it encourages. All these things which are wonderful and that Sam Ogden loved about the state. Um, but you cannot turn over the human landscape 100% or whatever and then and keep it the same. It's not going to be the same community. And there were very little recognition of that back in the 40s and 50s, or before that. But there was a lot of that. Yeah, Alan, please. Do you think that Vermont has something like a career and development policy today? How would you, how would you characterize what passes as uh, strategic planning and development policy where we are right now? Um, well, as a historian, I'm very reluctant or loath to um, say about where we are now. It's not what I study, but I would tell you that um, the a, um, economics professor at UVM, who I admire very much, and I'm, his name's escaped me. Anyway, he calls Vermont's economy a ticking time bomb. There aren't enough young people. It's a ticking time. It's a, the, the, the economy's a ticking time bomb. There aren't enough young people. There isn't. The, Vermont has put in place a lot of strategies and plans and zoning and management and all these things that make it so it's a beautiful place to live and a wonderful place. But as the population ages and you don't replace the young people, that generation that creates all the wealth between the ages of, say, 30 and 60, that cohort we're losing and the population's aging. And at some point, we're not going to be able to, we're going to spend all our money on health care. You know? And so, I mean, if you were to talk to him, it's like this doomsday scenario where like, everyone in Vermont's going to be in their 70s and, and there won't be any young people and the economy will collapse and we'll all live in caves or something like that. And uh, I am not an, I would take his word for it. How are we going to support schools when healthcare is going to be such a huge expense? Um, so, uh, art, 
oh, God, some bad names, but anyway. Art Wolf. The Art Wolf, sorry. You would, I, if he was here, he'd be like, I'll answer that question. Vermont's in terrible shape. I, I guess when I, when I look at what's going on at the state level, in the legislature, in gubernatorial administration, it seems to me it's, I mean, there's concern. What do we do? How do we get keep our people in the state? How do we keep our farms fired? How are we going to cultivate small-scale manufacturing? But it all seems pretty peaceful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem, and it's hard to do, but it doesn't seem like the state has made a lot of progress um, putting in place or even articulating ways to actually support the kinds of constructive changes that people want to see in terms of job creation, affordability, keeping our people in the state, mm -hmm. keeping our people in like I said, I think it's always hard to do. Yeah. We've, you would say Vermont's done a better job of managing the physical landscape than it has the human one. Right? I think that's one of the interesting things that comes out of the book is that when, when policymakers and legislators come up with these ideas and these policies and strategies, there's a lot of unintended consequences. And that's one of the things one, is that there doesn't often seem to be enough forethought about what might this actually do to certain groups of people in our community mm -hmm. if, if these kinds of changes get put in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean I, you know, living in Danville, um, it's, the town is unimaginable without the long-term families, the families that arrived in the 1790s and 1830s. Those people are really, really important. Tim, are you going to live in, you live in Danville when you grow up? Absolutely not. Which is fine. I know, of course you're not. You can, but I know you're not going to. And it's nice to have a mix of those kinds of people. But I mean, everyone in town benefits enormously from the people who are really invested. You know, that's the community. The community is um, not a building. It's, you can see that tree? Well, one time there was a dog stuck in that tree. I don't know how the dog got up in the tree, but then the dog fell out, and that's how your grandmother met your grandfather. It's that tree. All right, that's community. And so managing the human landscape in a way that you preserve that is a big challenge. I, do you think that the state gives enough thought to that? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's hard to see a coherent strategy from where I see. School stuff. The school legislation to consolidate the schools so that many small communities are going to lose their schools. I think that's going to be very bad for communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you should see how many people come to Danville high school basketball games. I'm from Philadelphia, it's not very good basketball, but it doesn't really matter, you know? <laughs> I mean, but it's, you know, that's community. That's community. And it's uh, your grandfather played for the team, and your father played for the team, and now you play for the team. Um, you know, that's community. Yeah, please, yeah. I feel, I feel Vermont, as you accurately described in your earlier book, Vermont has become commuter Vermont. We got probably 200 towns that have no industry and not many jobs. So, people commute to the next town. And this has a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. We only have 39 town meetings left. All of those commuters have a limit, even though they live in the town, they have a limited attachment to the town as a town. Their interest is likely to be in the town where they work, even though they don't live there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And civic engagement was what, what attracted Sam Ogden to the town um, so much, and what was the very central to my way of life, um, you know, is really dependent on people being really invested in their town and how well their town is doing. Um, and you don't think that there's enough of that, that spirit. Certainly, you think people commuting out of the town to work works against that. Yeah, and the the impact 
It's gradual, but the impact on the physical landscape of that is dramatic. Um, people want the rural Vermont landscape, um, but if people aren't farming, if you know one farm after another gets converted to someone's house and the land doesn't work, the biggest difference in land growth. At the end of the book, I didn't even have to spell it out. You know, in some ways, the community in land growth is very much like the community that was in Dorset in the 1870s, um, and in some ways, it's really radically different. And probably the chief way I'd say it's really radically different is that land growth is not a working landscape. It's a, it's a visual landscape, but it's not a working landscape. People don't work the land. And that's a really big difference. And too many towns become like that, then, well, it's a problem. I think Amanda wants us to wrap up. Is that about 3 o'clock? It is about that time. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Now you can all go outside and play.